evening and welcome to the latest Jeffrey B. Graham Perspectives on Ocean Science, August the 13th, uh, 2007. My name is uh, Nigella Hilgarth and I'm the Executive Director of the Birch Aquarium at Scripps. And it's great pleasure, it gives me great pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Dr. Dan Lubin. Dan has served as an Associate Director of the California Space Institute at Scripps since 1999 and he received a master's degree in astronomy and astrophysics from the University of Chicago in 1980, 1988, and a PhD in geophysical science from the University of Chicago in 1989. And with his colleagues, Dan made the first measurements of enhanced ultraviolet radiation under anthropogenic ozone depletion at Palmer Station in the Antarctic between August and December 1988. And he came to SIO in 1990 as a postgraduate researcher, and he specialized in remote satellite sensing of the Earth's polar regions. And he joined the SIO uh, research team, the staff, in 1993. And since then, he's been a principal investigator at SIO for the uh, Arctic and Antarctic Research Center here at, uh, since 1994. And so he's extremely well equipped to tell us all the things that we want to know about how rapidly the poles are melting, whether those polar bears have got a hope, how the penguins are doing in Antarctica. So I'm really looking forward to his talk, Global Warming and the Polar Regions, Undeniable Signs of Human Impact. Good evening. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, today I'm going to give you a, a brief overview, or, or, or as compact an overview as, as I can, of the, um, of the un, un, unmistakable signs of climate warming in the polar regions. And of course, the, the poles are very distinct uh, regions, one from the other. The Arctic, of course, is a, a frozen ocean, at least for the time being, uh, surrounded by land. And uh, the, uh, the Antarctic is a high frozen continent surrounded by the world, world's most dangerous ocean. Uh, very, very different climate regimes. The Ar Antarctic tends to be a lot colder, um, but we're going to see some common threads in the, uh, the influences of, of human-induced climate warming on, on both of these polar regions. Um, both, each one of these, e both the Antarctic and the Arctic need their own talks, uh, to tell you the truth. Uh, to, tonight I'll just hit the highlights, but probably in a few months after I get back from some field work uh, later this spring, I'll, um, I'll do an Arctic talk and then maybe after that uh, hit some more highlights of the Antarctic and separate talks because they, they're really complex and need, uh, need separate uh, presentations. But so I can give you some of the highlights tonight just to, to orient you, um, to help you understand what's in the news media and so forth. Um, even in the early days of climate modeling, uh, it's been realized that there should be a polar amplification of, of climate warming. And the early climate models, even with their simplified physics, predicted that uh, whereas the, uh, the Earth's climate on the global average might warm one or two degrees with uh, the typical increases in CO2, in the, in the Arctic this might be four or five degrees. Um, and this has been predicted with the standard traditional classical feedback <coughs> mechanisms, which I'll describe. Um, but now we know that there are even more, comp more complications related to meteorology and, um, and dynamical trends. And this is just one of many, uh, this, this figure here is one of many um, uh, papers on the, just the surface observations of the climate warming in the Arctic that, that tends to be most pronounced during winter and spring, less so during summer. And these are, this is just a, a report of the surface observations, which have long correlated with the climate model simulations. Um, the other thing we've known for some time, uh, we've been fortunate that back in 1978, NASA launched a microwave satellite, uh, a microwave imager uh, called the, uh, SSM, the SMMR. And uh, after that, the NOAA followed on with uh, a program called the Special Sensor Microwave Imager. And these uh, microwave imagers have been mapping sea ice continuously for more than 20 years. And we have a good record of how the sea ice throughout the Arctic has been thinning, both thinning and uh, decreasing in area. And uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, the IPCC 2007 just released a report. Um, and this is a paper uh, of which Richard Somerville here at Scripps was one of the, uh, the authors. And uh, he has shown uh, the, the, the panel to, uh, to look at is the bottom one here. 
This is a, a plot of the sea level, trend in sea level rise. And uh, what's worth noting here is beginning around 1993, where we had satellite altimetry measurements of sea level, the rise has increased slightly, and it actually uh, is it's coincident with one of the worst case scenarios in the IPCC uh, climate model simulations that are used to assess how uh, our climate is predicted to respond over the next couple or next hundred years to various uh, reductions or lack thereof in, in CO2 loading of the atmosphere. And um, wh wh what's worth noting here is that the sea level change is, is, is as high as the, the worst case scenario in these predictions. And 50% of this sea level rise is directly attributable to the loss of the ice caps and the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. One word of caution here, this is only a 10-year trend. We can't extrapolate this out uh, 100 years yet. We don't know if this is some sort of cycle yet, but it is consistent with the worst case uh, scenario in uh, climate model simulations. Um, of that, um, that 50% of the sea level rise that's attributable to the loss of the ice caps. Uh, this is a breakdown uh, by another set of authors that, um, that shows how much is attributable to glaciers and ice caps worldwide, or, um, and then Greenland versus Antarctica. Uh, th these estimates vary. Um, some say that the Antarctic is a little more than Greenland, but, uh, but we're seeing that the Antarctic and the Arctic are contributing quite a bit to sea level rise in the loss of the, uh, the ice sheets. I'll say just a couple words before I move into the polar regions about climate modeling in general. Um, sometimes uh, we climate researchers find ourselves in trouble just with the word model. A, a model mean, the word model means many things to many people. Uh, to a psychologist or an economist, it might mean some simple construct written on the back of an envelope. Um, but in, uh, in, in, in climate research, a model is uh, the most sophisticated theoretical construct possible simulating the, uh, the atmosphere, ocean, and land. Uh, processes and, and it's essentially limited by computer power and um, the more powerful your computer the more uh, the greater your ability to simulate um, with more greater complexity the various processes we know uh, occur in the atmosphere ocean and land and also the uh, the cryosphere and this is just a figure uh, courtesy of Warren Washington at, uh, at NCAR where he, is, he shows the, ev the evolution of the climate models uh, in sophistication uh, just as essentially as a function of computer power and uh, we see that uh, in the present day, we're able to uh, not only just do atmospheric circulation and greenhouse gases, uh, we've been able to do that for a couple decades now, but the sea ice models are becoming quite sophisticated. They're now, the models are now coupled to the ocean very well, and we're able to uh, put more subtle effects in, such as the, um, the effects of aerosols on the, climate, on the climate system, and we're also coupling the, the climate models with the land. So these are becoming very, very sophisticated, and with each, pa each passing decade, they do a better job uh, of, of simulating present day climate and then fr from that we have more defensible extrapolations to future climate change scenarios based on CO2 loading. And uh, I'm going to talk a little about aerosols as the segment of this talk that features my own research but uh, I just wanted to make another uh, point of emphasis here. Um, this is a, a plot you've probably seen many times of, uh, of the global average temperature uh, trend uh, since the beginning of the, uh, since the Industrial Revolution went into full swing in the uh, late 19th century. And uh, some of you are very familiar that the observations show actually a leveling off in temperature uh, from the 1940s to the 1960s, followed by uh, the, the more steep rise in global average surface temperature. And for a couple decades, the climate models could not reproduce that. Uh, we, we know that if we just put in natural variability, uh, il illustrated by the blue curve here, then, um, then we don't get a warming at all. Uh, that it also includes the changes that we know in solar variability. Um, however, for a long time, we couldn't reproduce that plateau uh, from the 1940s to the 1960s in, um, in global average temperature. And a lot of the naysayers in, 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 in this whole issue uh, looked at that and said, uh, hey, your models really don't reproduce what's going on in nature, so maybe it's just a theory we shouldn't pay too much attention to. Um, but when we have, now we have the ability to put air, anthropogenic aerosol, basically industrial emissions, into the, um, into the climate models. With that increase in sophistication, we have the um, ability to simulate the uh, industrial loading of the atmosphere post-World War II, where there was an industrial boom. And when you put that in, and the uh, radiative properties of the aerosol in decreasing sunlight, then we see that the climate models, as indicated by the, um, the red line compared to the black line here, 
they, uh, they reproduce very well, that plateau, followed by the rise from the 1960s onward. So this is just an, an illustration that with each passing decade and increase in sophistication in these climate models, we, we become, become more confident in our uh, explanation of the, obs the observations. And uh, that's one of the, uh, th that's what makes these climate models one of the great tools. We observe things in nature and now we can attribute them uh, quite conclusively to human impact on the atmosphere. Um, this is the classical mechanism, which has been known for many years, uh, that, that brings about uh, much of the polar amplification of, of climate warming. It's called the ice albedo feedback mechanism. At any given time, uh, the uh, part of the Arctic is frozen, uh, but if you manage to melt some of the snow or some of the ice, you will reduce the albedo or the, uh, the reflectance, the, uh, the extent to which the surface reflects energy back to space. And as you reduce the albedo, the surface then absorbs more energy, which increases the melt rate of melting and um, accelerates the melting, further reducing the albedo and increasing the energy absorption. So you have a positive feedback, leading to a decrease in uh, sea ice cover and a warming of the local climate and the local surface air temperature. This has been, a, uh, this has been occurring with some reliability every time we've uh, put you know, ice and snow into the climate models. They tend to reproduce this, and we know that that contributes uh, to the to warming in the Arctic to quite a, a great extent. And this is just an, an illustration from a field experiment I was on about, um, about 10 years ago called Sheba, uh, which was a, uh, an icebreaker, a Canadian icebreaker frozen into the Arctic for a, 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 an entire year. And um, you can see in May, the, the sea ice cover looks very solid and, 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 and quite reflective. We, would, we didn't stay on the ship the entire year. We flew back and forth on Twin Otters. And back in May of 2008, when I was there, or I'm sorry, 1998 when I was there, we were able to land these Twin Otters with ease on the, um, on the, on the ice floe right there and, and go aboard the ship. But by the time I left in June, you can see what's happening. The, uh, the ice is starting to melt. We're starting to get melt ponds on the ice. And you can see how less, much less reflective that ice surface is. At that point, the ice runway was beginning to, to deteriorate. And I, I got off on the last flight that was even possible out of Sheba before the people were kind of stuck there the whole summer uh, with no way to get off the ship. There, there are two types of ice we need to distinguish from to, to first order, um, what's called um, multi-year ice or ice that remains uh, consistently there in a, in a pack for, from one year to the next and that uh, is what we see in the central Arctic and then there's also marginal or first year ice and that's the ice that's, that freezes and expands in aerial extent and then contracts uh, with uh, changes of seasons. Um, and what's important to note is that um, the satellite mapping instruments that I just described are, uh, are capable of distinguishing the two because they measure at several microwave frequencies, actually three for the SSMI, and with clever algorithms you can tell first year ice by, from multi-year ice by the, uh, the different emissivity of the surface types. And um, so the satellites have been able to distinguish the multi-year ice for the first, from the first year ice and show that there's been a trend in decreasing area of the multi-year ice. So here, if, we, if you notice from 1988 through uh, 2001 in this particular study, one of several excellent ones, um, we see a decrease in the uh, aerial extent of the multi-year ice. That's the ice that's uh, there from one season, uh, from one year to the next, um, particularly uh, north of Siberia and north of Alaska. And you can interpret the satellite uh, remote sensing data further, and you can uh, estimate the, the, the dates of melt onset and freeze onset. And here, this is done um, by these same authors for uh, two, de two decades, the 1970s through the 80s, or essentially the 1980s and then the, uh, the 1990s. And we see that uh, the melt onset uh, is uh, fairly late, typically um, late May into June for most of the Arctic during the 80s where it, it, gets, it shifts back into mid to early May uh, during the 90s. The freeze onset uh, displays the opposite effect. It, it, um, it comes out a little later. The freeze onset occurs a little later during the, 90s, the 1990s versus the 80s. And so we have longer melt seasons uh, in more recent years. Uh, we don't just rely on, um, on satellite remote sensing uh, to do this work. There was a wonderful set of cruises during the 1990s called uh, SISEX, where the U.S. Navy, uh, with the, the winding down of the Cold War, began retiring a lot of their nuclear submarines that they didn't quite need anymore, that had been prowling around up there for decades. And um, 
they made some of these, these ships available to researchers, and uh, the first cruise was so successful, they had a follow-on series of cruises. Now, I was still kind of a young researcher at that time, and my, uh, being an atmospheric scientist, I, I couldn't find a justification to go aboard these ships. I, my grantsmanship was not that, uh, that well honed at that point. I think I could pull it off now if this experiment was uh, kept on going, but in any case, this was a wonderful set of experiments. Um, in that it, they made some, some very robust transects of the Arctic Ocean, and because these, these ships had been prowling around there for decades, beginning with the Nautilus in, in 1958, uh, there were data sets to compare to from decades uh, previous. And um, what was derived from all this by Drew Rothrock et al. Um, was a series of trends in sea ice thickness that's consistently decreasing through the Arctic. So from the satellites and the in situ observations from submarines, we know that the aerial extent of the multi-year ice is, is shrinking and the sea ice is becoming thinner. Now the climate models, going back to them, um, this is one of uh, several excellent papers that are out uh, recently. Um, just using the climate change scenarios uh, put forth by IPCC and predicting the um, the sea ice loss with the coupled sea ice and, and climate models. And um, what's quite frightening here is if, if we were to go about business as usual, this is a CO2 increase to 800 parts per million by 2100, the Arctic sea ice entirely disappears. Um, a gradual level off in CO2 consistent with some effort at, at stabilizing emissions, uh, we still lose about a third of it by 2100. So uh, the Arctic is quite sensitive. Uh, and, and the observations that we're seeing of sea ice loss are unmistakably attributable to the, uh, to the CO2 loading of the atmosphere from industrial emissions. Not only the sea ice uh, is, is being impacted, but um, also the, the great ice sheets themselves. Uh, this is more satellite remote sensing data uh, of the, um, the melt season on the Greenland ice sheets. And, um, this is quite straightforward to do with any kind of radar scatterometer. These scatterometers are, were initially developed to measure sea surface winds, but they've proven quite useful uh, over ice sheets in that uh, whenever you have a, um, a dry ice, uh, a dry snow surface, a dry snowpack, the, uh, the surface is quite reflective to a radar beam, uh, but that radar pulse gets attenuated quite a bit when there's any liquid water in the snow. So there's a direct, um, a direct measure of the, um, the presence of melting snow and its aerial extent. And we see here four snapshots, uh, years 1992 through 1999, uh, showing an increase in the melting area uh, of the Greenland ice sheet. And this is uh, extending this work out to 2005, uh, done by Connie Steffen at, uh, at Colorado uh, from another radar scatter order, the QuickScat. And uh, you can see how just between 1992 and 2005, the, the, melt, the melt extent has doubled in area and is actually extended above the 2,000 meter elevation line. So quite a bit of loss in, in, in the, uh, the Greenland ice sheet has been noted so far. Now, so far I've just talked about the classical uh, ice albedo feedback mechanism, but in the climate models um, we have a new perspective and the climate models actually reproduce this effect. Um, it's funny how uh, many of the naysayers of climate warming will, will say, how do we know it's just not some natural cycle? And they say this as if we climate researchers don't know of any natural cycles and have never heard of them. Um, that, that we know of many, and, and we follow them, and we, we, put them, we make sure that the models reproduce them. One very important one for the, uh, the polar regions are called the, uh, the annular modes, uh, also known as the Arctic Oscillation or the Antarctic Oscillation. The same kind of natural cycle occurs in both polar regions. Um, it's a kind of a, I don't want to get too much uh, into, the, into the meteorological detail here, but you can think of the, uh, the Arctic Oscillation as simply a seesaw in surface pressure um, between subpolar and polar latitudes. And this manifests itself in strengthening or weakening of the circumpolar westerlies um, from roughly uh, 50 degrees north uh, toward the pole. And th this is a, this is a, uh, a very a complex uh, mode in that it doesn't vary in some normal periodic way. It can switch sign very suddenly, monthly or annually. It's something we just observe and try to make sense of. And it's characterized by an, by an index, um, basically a difference in sea level pressures between uh, subarctic and arctic um, latitudes. And uh, when that index is negative, um, meaning roughly r relatively high pressure over the polar regions, lower over lower latitudes, uh, we have relatively weak westerlies and cold air spilling out further to the, the south. When we have um, the high index, um, 
we have stronger westerlies, and they, those contain more cold air to the north, and they also allow warmer air to advect into the polar regions. And we have been moving uh, throughout the past two decades into a period of high northern annular mode index, or high Arctic oscillation index. And um, you can see that in this graphic here, where our darker shading is where the northern annular mode index becomes more positive by one standard deviation than the, uh, the long-term mean. This also happens in the, southern in, in the southern hemisphere. There's a southern annular mode, very similar uh, in definition and uh, in behavior to the northern annular mode. And uh, Gareth Marshall of the British Antarctic Survey is, um, has reproduced this from observations, and there is a, definitely a 30-year trend toward a positive index in the southern annular mode. So what, 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 did the, what does this do? In the, in the northern hemisphere, the Arctic Oscillation, as it shifts into a positive index, uh, it changes the, uh, the nature of the sea ice circulation in the Arctic Ocean. When the index is low, there's, a, there's more clockwise recirculation in the Beaufort Gyre, and ice remains in the central Arctic and, and has a chance to grow thicker. When the index is an, in a high phase, then we, you reduce that recirculation and you have more ice transport out of the Fram Strait into the North Atlantic. So this is this uh, natural cycle, this mode of variability. Well, how does this relate to global warming? Actually, there is a, uh, a very real, albeit complex, relationship. The, um, there's a connection between the stratosphere and the troposphere. Uh, as, as you probably know, um, as the troposphere has been warming due to our, uh, our greenhouse gas increases, just by radiative balance principles, that has to result in a cooling of the stratosphere. That's been, well known, that's been known for some time. Um, these fluctuations in this natural cycle uh, of an annular mode, they're accompanied by changes in the strength of a, pol of a uh, sort of a polar jet stream called the polar night jet. And when we were in a high index of the annular mode, the polar night jet is quite strong, the stratosphere is colder, and the ozone layer is thinner. Um, when that polar night jet is strong, you get a refraction of planetary waves back toward the equator. And planetary waves are, are waves that transport energy from lower latitudes to the polar regions and warm it. Uh, conversely, when you weaken the polar night jet, you get planetary waves diverted back t toward the pole and bringing energy and, and uh, warming potential to the polar regions. So all that's happening, but uh, we have to realize there is a connection to climate warming. Greenhouse gas uh, warming cools the stratosphere as it warms the troposphere. And this, this strengthens the equator to pole temperature gradient. And um, the wintertime westerlies in the lower stratosphere are then, st are then strengthened. Planetary waves are refracted toward the tropics before they impact the polar night jet. And the res result is that, that a, a climate warming caused by our greenhouse gas um, emissions tends to shift the annular modes into a high index. And that's what we've been seeing in both, both hemispheres, a shift toward a high index in the annular modes. And so that's a dynamical positive feedback uh, from from the greenhouse gas emissions, in addition to the uh, ice albedo feedbacks that have uh, um, been started by the greenhouse gas radiative properties themselves. And I'll come back to, to that a little bit So when I talk about the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, I'm going to get into another uh, subtle effect, and that's the, the, the role of aerosols on, uh, on the climate system. The Arctic is quite different than the Antarctic in, in one way, and the Arctic is polluted for half the year. The, um, during the winter time, the, the Arctic air mass becomes somewhat isolated in the strong westerlies. And in Russia and, and Europe and, and parts of Asia, there are a lot of factories and a lot of, a lot of industrial emission quite far north, not so much in the US and Canada, mostly in Europe. And the, these aerosol particles from this industrial activity get trapped in the Arctic atmosphere. And uh, they stay there for about half a year. Uh, the visibility there is noticeably reduced. And uh, the radiative balance of the Arctic is, uh, is um, altered significantly, and we've known this for about 100 years. Uh, the the uh, famous explorer Nansen noticed that there was uh, soot on the ice when he did his cruises way back at the end of the 19th century. Um, this has various effects on the climate system. Uh, Jim Hansen at Goddard has uh, recently been publishing papers showing that when this aerosol gets into the snow, it reduces the albedo somewhat, and then uh, that enhances the ice albedo feedback just by enabling the snow to absorb more energy and, uh, and melt more rapidly, and, and then hence the sea ice as well. So this is just a, a, a schematic showing the, um, the pollution sources um, and, the, and, and the transport pathways of the Arctic haze. Uh, this, 
it was known for quite a bit, uh, for, it was known for quite some time, uh, beginning in the 1950s during the Cold War when the U.S. Navy was snooping around with uh, reconnaissance flights all over the Arctic. Many pilots would come back and, uh, note and report that they could barely see anything. Uh, an atmospheric chemist by the name of Glenn Shaw up at the University of Alaska Fairbanks uh, pioneered studies of, of Arctic haze and uh, did some uh, pioneering work in their chemistry and uh, identified their sources uh, with a, a high degree of accuracy. Um, during the winter and into the spring, these uh, aerosol particles are trapped in, in the Arctic, in the central Arctic, and they affect the climate. And then at, at, towards the, uh, the late spring uh, into the summer, they begin to, to be removed by precipitation. The Arctic is cloudy most of the time, and these, these clouds and the precipitation that uh, is accelerated during summer tends to make these particles rain out. Um, but they're there for a, a good part of the year, and they affect the climate. And some of the research I've been working on most recently is uh, looking at some of the subtle effects of the Arctic haze on, um, on, the, on, on the climate of the region. And uh, this is something you may have seen in some of the other talks on climate uh, about aerosol direct and indirect effects. Uh, we all know that there's this thing called the Asian brown cloud and, and global dimming. That, that's a manifestation of direct aerosol effect, whereby aerosols, just by being there, they cut down the sunlight reaching the Earth's surface by tens of watts per square meter, much larger, in fact, than the, uh, the radiative warming due to the greenhouse gas emissions. At the same time, they, uh, they warm the lower atmosphere, alter the hydrological cycle. Um, they, they create another complication to the entire climate problem. Um, what can also happen uh, is when aerosols get into the clouds, they change the microphysical properties of the clouds. Um, and uh, essentially, for a given amount of precipitable water vapor, they will, um, they will manifest in more cloud condensation nuclei and then decrease the average size of the cloud particle. And that does two things. If you're at low latitudes, uh, uh, over where we live, if you introduce aerosols into a cloud and reduce the mean cloud uh, particle size, you increase the reflectivity of the cloud. And so you help the cloud cool the climate system. It reflects more sunlight to space because its, it's droplets are, are, uh, are smaller on average. But in the Arctic, uh, something else happens. In the Arctic, the, uh, the radiation from the cloud, the terrestrial or long wave radiation, is a larger portion of the, and of the energy balance up there. And uh, so the long wave radiative effects of changing this cloud particle size are actually more significant. And when you, um, when you reduce the droplet size of the cloud particles, uh, in, in principle, you should increase the emissivity of the cloud, increase the ability of the cloud to radiate back toward the Earth's surface. In, in, in effect, you should be able to enhance the ability of the cloud to, to warm the surface and, and in, in essence, cause another, uh, add another source of warming to the Arctic climate. And uh, there have been another, a number of theoretical, theoretical studies on that. And uh, the question is, can we actually observe it in nature? Uh, just to define a few terms here, I, I mentioned emissivity. Um, what is emissivity? Um, so, so you're not lost. It's just um, a fundamental law that says that an, you know, an object radiates uh, a flux of electromagnetic electromagne radiation uh, that's proportional to, roughly to the fourth power of its temperature. And em the emissivity is a constant in front of that sigma t to the fourth uh, Stefan Boltzmann law. Um, if the emissivity is one, then the object is radiating as efficiently as possible. It's called a black body or an ideal radiator. Very thick clouds with a lot of water uh, in them uh, are effectively black body radiators. If the emissivity is less than one, then it's called a gray body, and it's not radiating as efficiently as it can. Um, that's true of the thinner clouds you find in the Arctic, and the emissivity varies with the the size of the, the water or ice particles in the cloud and also with the amount of water that's in the cloud. Um, this is a, a, an illustration uh, as a function of wavelength of essentially of the, uh, the Earth's greenhouse effect. And this is the kind of thing we're going to measure to, uh, to get at these, um, these subtle effects of aerosols and clouds. Um, what this is is a downwelling emission spectrum of the infrared radiation back radiated from the atmosphere to the Earth's surface, and this is actually measured in the Arctic. The light blue curve here um, shows what the emission from the atmosphere to the Earth's surface looks like under clear skies. And uh, if you look at the wavelength 15 microns, you see uh, a large maximum in that radiation. This is the carbon dioxide, the big carbon dioxide emission band. And when we're talking about increasing CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere, all we're really doing is making that band just a little bit wider, typically around here. But that in this band, the atmosphere is entirely opaque, and it's radiating toward the Earth's surface, essentially from the lower few meters of the atmosphere. 
and the surface temperature here was just around freezing, and as you can see here, I've plotted equivalent temperature curves as a function of wavelength, and uh, you can see that in this carbon dioxide band, we're getting radiation essentially from the lower few meters of the atmosphere. Here's the water vapor emission band, and this, the thing is, uh, it behaves similarly. This is where water vapor opacity is, uh, is maximized. Here, um, this is the, the, the range of the atmosphere where a lot of infrared sensors, uh, a lot of infrared uh, goggles, night vision goggles work and so forth. It's called the window. And uh, the, the atmosphere is quite transparent to radiation in the window, except for a little ozone emission feature here. Half of this is from stratospheric ozone, half of this uh, energy is from ozone in the troposphere. Um, this, is, this window is what's filled in by clouds. As cl clouds come along, they emit a lot more energy toward the Earth's surface and they warm the climate system. And the instrument we use to measure this, uh, I, I've worked with these instruments for many years when I was a postdoc, I sort of, I, I built one, uh, not entirely from scratch, but put one together from commercial components. There's an excellent instrument deployed by the um, Department of Energy Atmospheric Radiation, or At Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Program called the ARI. And it's essentially a Michelson interferometer, uh, an FTIR system um, that measures uh, the uh, terrestrial emission spectrum of the atmosphere, and the, the, uh, the University of Wisconsin that's, de that's developed this instrument has done a fantastic job of making this thing very, very accurate, very precise. And these things have been deployed uh, at several places around the world for 10 years now, and they're putting out a wealth of data into the exact detail of the greenhouse effect. Um, U.S. Department of Energy's Atmospheric Radiation Management Program is so one of these unique resources for climate research, and I, I've uh, been very, very privileged to be supported by them for a number of years now. Um, what they decided to do back in the late 1980s was to say, okay, climate models are wonderful, but why don't we um, actually try to measure um, what goes on in these climate model grid cells uh, with the, the most advanced instrumentation possible, the kind of things we take on ships for a few months or, or do or take on aircraft field campaigns for a few months. Why don't we invest some money and put them there for for years on end, in, essentially in perpetuity, as long as we can keep doing that. And they chose three sites to do that. One was in the middle of Oklahoma, and uh, another is in the tropical western Pacific. And a third one, uh, that's of most interest to me, is at, at the north slope of Alaska. And they have a, a, a remarkable suite of very advanced meteorological and atmospheric uh, radiation measurement instruments up there. And they've had that in there since 1998. And they now have a, they, we have a wealth of data um, on the Arctic climate system now from that. Going back to how we determine if there's an aerosol indirect, indirect effect affecting the clouds, from just radiative transfer theory, we can calculate how the emission spectrum should vary as we vary the, um, the liquid water content and the effective particle size or effective radius of the cloud droplets. And then we can see if the measurements of that match that. And uh, here are two measurements uh, expect as, expressed as brightness temperature from that airy instrument um, under very similar clouds, but um, one with high aerosol concentration and one with very clean air. And you notice that for very similar clouds, there's, a, there's quite a difference in the spectrum throughout the uh, middle infrared window. We can actually use these spectra to retrieve the cloud particle sizes, the average cloud particle sizes um, directly. But, um, What's of interest from a, for a, a statistical study is to know that, to see if this appears consistently in the data. And in fact, we see that it does. Um, we see that uh, under high uh, CN or high aerosol loading, the um, the clouds are much more consistent with smaller effective droplet radius just by their their spectral measurements. And that's something you really can't get out of a simple measurement. You need this the spectral radiometer to to distinguish this effect. And what is the size of this effect? If we co-locate these measurements where we use the spectral radiometer to determine where that indirect effect is happening, if we co-locate that with an independent measurement of the downwelling flux um, back rated from the atmosphere to the surface, we find that there's um, up to eight watts per square meter more when the aerosols are present. And without going into too much detail, we can attribute 3.4 watts per square meter on a climatological average to the presence of the aerosols. And it's the pollution affecting the clouds, making the droplets smaller. And this is comparable to the radiative effect of CO2 increase. So these pollution aerosols that are up in the Arctic um, from industrial activity are enhancing the warming of the Arctic during the winter and early spring by changing the, the, the size of the cloud particles such that they emit more radiation toward the surface. Okay, now I'll, um, I'll move on to the Antarctic. Um, a couple of um, highlights from, uh, 
from the Antarctic. The big one is the Antarctic Peninsula. The Antarctic Peninsula is actually the largest warming we're seeing anywhere on Earth, the largest warming trend. And there have been a number of measurements, and, and there are a number of studies, particularly by the British Antarctic Survey, that are shedding a lot of light on that. The, the British uh, Antarctic program is essentially in the Antarctic Peninsula and the Wet LC region. Um, I mentioned uh, that there's a southern annular mode in addition to a northern annular mode. Um, that the, the southern annular mode is doing two things. It's cooling part of the Antarctic, the Antarctic continent, and it's allowing the Antarctic Peninsula to warm. As these westerlies become stronger and they shrink toward the pole, they isolate the air mass over the Antarctic continent such that the, con the Antarctic continent, the high Antarctic plateau, cools to space more effectively. Uh, whereas warmer air tends to get advected from lower latitudes in the Antarctic Peninsula region. Um, so now you, you may have seen in some newspapers that uh, there have been reports of Antarctic cooling uh, from the NASA satellites. This is by Joey Camiso at Goddard. Um, and so how, how is global warming happening if, if the Antarctic is cooling? Well, the, the greenhouse gases are affecting the annular mode, strength, putting it in a positive index, strengthening the westerlies, allowing the Antarctic continent to cool more effectively, whereas the Antarctic Peninsula warms because it's exposed more readily to, uh, to warmer air from northern latitudes. And the, the most dramatic manifestation of that has been the breakup of the Larsen ice shells, the, the A and B. Uh, here's a, um, a sequence of satellite images, uh, courtesy of Ted Scambos. Um, what, some of this goes back to the 60s with some of the classified spacecraft. But we see the, uh, the Larsen ice shells steadily shrinking in area. Um, over the passing decades. Just another figure showing the temperature trends uh, throughout the Antarctic Peninsula region, uh, the, the largest warmings on Earth. Uh, these are in degrees per decade. This is larger than anywhere else on Earth. And you notice how far north these, uh, the Larsen ice shelves are and, ha and have persisted um, until very recently. One. Uh, one thing that they noticed as they began to study the Larsen ice shelf is a lot of melt ponding on the ice shelf as the temperature warms. The Antarctic Peninsula is not all that cold, typically. It's a few tens of degrees below freezing during winter, but it's around freezing and a little warmer during uh, spring and summer. And uh, as you just get above the triple point of water, you get a lot of melt ponding on the ice. And what's happened uh, has been a dramatic breakup of the Larsen ice shelf. Um, this, is an area, this, this area here is about the size of Rhode Island. And this is a sequence of only a few weeks, beginning in January of 2002. Uh, where I'll, I'll, I'll scroll through this. You'll see how quickly the entire Larsen B ice shelf broke up, um, just from one satellite image to the next. You begin to see a lot of calving, even more. Now you pretty much have, uh, have icebergs instead of an ice shelf here. By March, um, only a few weeks later, the entire Larsen ice B ice shelf is gone. And this is what we attribute, uh, this is the mechanism we attribute to it. Um, when you get that, that melt ponding um, from the, uh, just a little bit of warming, just raising the, uh, the ambient temperature above the triple point of water, you get melt ponding that increases the pressure in the, in the crevasses within the ice, uh, creating a lot of mechanical pressure, which then helps to break up the ice shelf. What we do know is when we correlate some of the temperature anomalies that are well above freezing, that correlates in time with uh, the exact episodes of breakup that we know, that we observe from satellite data from the Larsen ice shelf. Here, here's a, a record of the breakups as observed from satellite data. And it's, it's, you notice, if you notice the, um, the temperature, whenever it exceeds, when it, when it pops above freezing, that's where you notice a lot more of the breakups. And so this, this is how we attribute the breakup of the Larsen ice shelf to the peninsula warming. And that's uh, helping to contribute towards sea level rise. Not only is the, the ice shelf breaking up, but the, um, the glaciers feeding the ice shelves are accelerating in the, the rate at which they discharge ice. And you can consistently see that upward trend in the, um, in the flow speed of, uh, of virtually all the glaciers that feed the Larsen ice shelf. And this is just one photograph of, uh, of one of these things breaking off. This is, a, I guess, uh, Ted is right here. It's a small, uh, a small iceberg for the Antarctic, you know, a massive tabular berg. Um, recently, Maria Vernet here uh, at Scripps uh, published in, uh, in Nature on, um, on the ecology of these large icebergs as they, they break off the Larsen ice shelf, drift north, and then get, get, get caught in the, uh, the circumpolar uh, gyre around Antarctica. They become sort of an oasis for uh, 
a wide variety of marine life. Um, I don't have any stories about the polar bears yet, but I do about the penguins. Uh, in, in the Antarctic Peninsula region, uh, we're seeing dramatic shifts uh, in, in penguin populations, and this is work that Bill Fraser has been doing for decades on the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, there, there are three common species of penguins on the Antarctic Peninsula, the Adelis, the, the Gentoos, and the Chinstraps. The Adelis are true Antarctic penguins in that they overwinter on the ice, and, uh, and they make their habitats a little further north uh, where they um, they form rookeries and, and hatch their chicks. Now these birds are, are not the brightest birds in the world. They, um, they tend to, uh, to nest always in the same place every year. Once a, a young, young bird decides where it's going to put its nest, it will always go back to that same spot within a couple of meters, year after year after year, throughout its life, and it will try to hatch eggs there. And if the climate changes to make that, that nesting area unsuitable, the bird just doesn't know any better and it keeps trying. And uh, what's been happening as the peninsula's been warming, there's been a lot, uh, a lot more precipitation on many of these islands, uh, particularly around Palmer Station and throughout the Antarctic Peninsula. A lot more precipitation, meaning uh, a lot more snow cover uh, in, in the areas where these birds have been nesting. And the snow cover essentially makes, uh, makes the nesting habitats non-viable for hatching birds. And you can see here, um, this poor bird is just trying to, he's come back to his same place every year and he's trying to hatch an egg. He's trying to incubate an egg right there uh, where there's snow cover and it's not working very well. Not only that, but as the sea ice has been retreating in the, in the western Antarctic Peninsula region, the, um, the, these, these birds overwinter on the sea ice and they need to, to forage from the sea ice when, they, uh, when they're trying to survive in the winter and as that ice retreats, they, they can't forage as well because of the darkness and that also impacts the viability of these colonies. Another thing that's been going on, as the sea ice has been retreating, elephant seals have been just taking up space. These things, they don't really harm the penguins, they just kind of t come and take up space and push them out of the way. And uh, we know that that's been uh, infecting the, uh, the viability of the colonies too. Um, so what's been happening uh, over the years is the colonies have just been failing to reproduce. Uh, this is uh, a colony that's sort of in decline, and th these five birds here are the remains of a colony that had been there for many years, but these birds just keep trying to come back and nest in the same place, and they just can't hatch the eggs as the climate, change, cli climate changes. Uh, here's some more uh, sort of pathetic pictures. Here's a bird that's just basically under the snow. He's there trying to incubate an egg. He doesn't know any better to try to move. Um, here's some more birds just doing the same thing. And, and we've been seeing for decades now penguin, Adelie penguin colonies uh, in, in, in quite dramatic decline on the peninsula um, due to the climate change and the increased precipitation o over many of the islands there where the rookeries are. And these are the invaders. These are the, the, the gentoos and the chinstraps are, are sub-Antarctic penguins. They overwinter further north and they're a lot more adaptable to this, uh, this changing environment and they've been taking over some of the areas that have been vacated uh, by the <coughs> the dwindling uh, Adelie colonies. And this is to say a, a graph, uh, essentially a, a lot of uh, Bill Fraser's work over the years, showing the, um, the breeding population uh, of the Adelies just in, in steady decline with the Antarctic warming trend and the invaders, the Gentoo and the Chinstraps, uh, taking advantage of that and, and colonizing what the Adelies are leaving behind. So just to summarize things, um, I've just hit only had time to hit a few highlights here. Um, the Arctic, uh, both the Arctic and the Antarctic are in impacted directly by uh, CO2 increases in the atmosphere. Um, human influences in the Arctic, we get direct modification of the greenhouse effect um, by CO2 increases and we get this ice albedo feedback and uh, a cloud radiation feedback as well, whereas a warmer atmosphere holds, uh, whereby a warmer atmosphere holds more, uh, more water vapor and there's thicker cloud cover and greater warming. We also have this uh, alteration of the Arctic Oscillation, strengthening it, uh, allowing more warm air to advect from lower latitudes into the Arctic, in kind of feeding back on the warming and also helping to take sea ice out of the Arctic Ocean. Then finally, some of the work that I've done recently uh, shows how industrial pollution aerosol alters the radiative properties of the Arctic clouds, increasing the, uh, the thermal radiation to the surface comparable, in, in a comparable level to the greenhouse gas increases, and that's an additional warming uh, of the Arctic climate system. 
On the Antarctic, uh, we're not seeing so much of the ice albedo feedback because the Antarctic is a little more dynamic, or actually a lot more dynamic in many ways, but we are seeing changes in the annular modes that are attributable not only to the greenhouse warming, but also to the ozone hole, the dramatic stratospheric ozone loss over the Antarctic. And um, these changes in the annular mode index are uh, essentially cooling the climate over the Antarctic continent and warming the climate over the Antarctic Peninsula. And the Antarctic Peninsula is the world's largest. And we're seeing ecological effects from that directly in the seabird colonies. And uh, so th those are the highlights. So uh, I'll, I'll take any questions now. And um, I'll, I'll come back in a few months uh, with some new data from a field program. And I'll, I'll talk about the, the Arctic and the Antarctic separately and give you a little bit more detail. Um, but for now, uh, hopefully this has uh, been useful to you at this point. Thank you.